Welcome to APSA Artworks, a four-part series where we introduce you to the world of the visual arts and how to go about building an investment portfolio of artworks. I am Dr. Paul Bayliss, APSA Senior Specialist Art Curator. Today is the second episode in the series, and I'm extremely excited with today's lineup, as our focus today is on how to build a collection. We will be looking at trends in the market, looking at artworks from both the lifestyle and an asset class investment, and discussing how to identify good artwork. I will be joined again by leading professionals within the financial sector, as well as a local personality that has a passion for supporting and championing the visual arts and for collecting. We will also have an opportunity to meet some of the local artists and be introduced to their works. One of the exciting things about working in the visual arts is the people you get to meet, but also the places that one has an opportunity of visiting. And today I'm really, really excited because we are live streaming from the Leonardo in Santon. All I can say is if you have not yet visited the, the Leonardo, you need to. The artwork within this place is breathtaking and we're gonna be introduced to it. So our first guest this morning is Robert Hodson, who is the general manager for marketing for Legacy, for the Legacy Hotel and Resort, and of which the Leonardo forms part of their portfolio. So, Robert, welcome and thank you for hosting us here today. Good morning, Paul. Thank you for joining us at the Leonardo. It's great to have you with us here today. It really is fantastic. And I'm loving this place. I mean, I'm just looking at this work here that we're going to unpack shortly by um, Lerato and just the, sim the simplicity around it, but also how you've given the space and given it ample breathing room. Exactly, and I think this is one of the hidden pieces in the Leonardo. It's really fantastic. As you come around the corner, it hits you. It's really great to have it. No, it does. And I mean, it's, I mean, the work, it's, I mean, people, I don't think people really appreciate it. And you say as you come around the corner, it hits you and, and it's hidden. It's 17 meters in length. I mean, it's not a small work. It's hand embroidered. I mean, you can see a bit of it behind me as well. So it really is a fantastic work. And maybe a bit about, about the work. It shows, you know, um, Lerato's, Shangan, and ancestry that shines through this particular work um, the colors that come through in terms of the luminous colors and which reminds one really much of childhood wonder of how the world works but there's a simplicity through it but it's a detail within the simplicity so as I said Robert thanks very much for hosting us here today um, and as I said in, in the introduction, we are at, at the Leonardo. And the entire, I mean, the Leonardo is a special place. The entire building was conceived with the idea of art and the architects, and, I, and all the architects were women. Am I that correct? is 100% correct. Wow. 100% correct. And that comes through. I mean, they designed the building in such a way where the art remains the hero. And as I said, what a collection. The curatorial approach in terms of the artworks is inspired by the artist and the visionary inventor himself, Leonardo da Vinci. And it really boasts a diversity of local, young, and established artists, designers, and fabricators. So before we get into our discussion this morning, um, Robert, let's just take, a um, take the viewers through a glimpse of some of the artwork that greets you as you arrive here.
And just some interesting facts around the Leonardo. It is the tallest building in South Africa, the second tallest building in Africa, and the tallest res residential building in Africa. The artworks within the building, over a hundred artists are represented therein. And just to share with us a, more of the vision of, um, we're just really going to share more of the vision behind the Leonardo. So Robert, just share with us a bit of who the Curio team was that really conceived this and, and um, brought this together. Paul, thanks. Um, once again, uh, great to have you with us at the Leonardo. The, the curatorial team is, um, is a gentleman by the name of Marcus Neustetter, who put together the art with his team. There's a hundred South African artists involved in this building, which probably brought about 500, with 500 support staff wow. in that. So it was a really big opportunity. It is only South African art. And I think the most interesting fact about it is when we designed the building, we designed the building around the art and not the art around the building. Mm. So we first decided what art was going to be there, <laughs> and then we decided how to design the yeah. building. Uh, Mbongeni Botelezi, he's got the showpiece at the entrance, which is, uh, which if we had waited for the, for, the, for the building to be built, and then it wouldn't have been the same. Mm. And he insisted on having that amazing space. And I think, you know, the, the building itself is definitely the beacon of hope for, for South Africa, Africa, and built in the worst economic times that could be built. But we believe in uh, what we're doing in South Africa. We believe in the, the economic uh, situation in South Africa that it can only get better. And I tell you, um, you can't miss this building. And it's no, really amazing. It's, it's, it's a beacon. And I mean, it stands out. It's so prominent, as, as you say. You, you, you drive past it, you can't, you can't miss it in Santon. It's, it's, a, it's a landmark in itself. And, and I think I received a picture last night, um, which unfortunately on this forum I can't share because it's impossible. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it stood out like, the, like a candle in the middle of Santon last night. The lighting was correct. Mm. The, the spire was on white. The, the red flame on the top, on top of the building. It, it, it's just the candle of hope for everything that we stand for and for what South Africans stand for and for the future. Mm. And like all hotels, I know you've been... Um, largely impacted by COVID-19. When did the Leonardo actually open? Leonardo is a, a really fun story because um, Leonardo opened officially on uh, around the end of February this year. Um, and then this amazing uh, COVID hit mm -hmm. us. And unfortunately, we were forced to, we were forced to close a lot of it down. Um, we hadn't done handovers to owners. We hadn't managed to get guests in yet, long stay <laughs> rentals. So it opened for the second time in August. Uh, so it's had a false start, um, but I tell you, now it's gaining traction in the market. And, mm. and you know, COVID is still with us, but Leonardo is a place to visit. It's a place <laughs> to see. It's a place people want to, want to, want to come and enjoy it with us. I mean, I, I I can talk about it all day, Paul, um, but I think uh, you might get a bit upset with me if I carry on about it the whole day. But it's a, it's, it's a destination. I mean, that's what I think that's what we're trying to say. I mean, you can come here in itself and be able to, within the ambience, be surrounded by fantastic art. And I think what more could one actually ask for? It's, it's a lifestyle all in one. I think that's what it encompasses. It encompasses culture, art, it encompasses great curated food. It encompasses the most amazing apartment hotel living, it, uh, which has been designed by, by top-end designers, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Falk. He designed it. Mm. He's probably one of the most well-known hotel designers and interior designers um, across the board in South Africa. So the rooms are also art. Wow. Um, the, the, the art in the rooms, we, we haven't got many pieces that are, that are, there's a maximum of 20 prints of the originals. So, so the building is just an original building and never been, it's not copied from anywhere else. You'll see buildings around Johannesburg. Yeah. They've been copied from elsewhere in the world. This building is unique. And the feeling that you want to, the person that comes here, I mean, what feeling do you want to leave them with as they, you know, as they spend time here? The, the feeling of the Leonardo and in Legacy's true spirit is that when you leave us, you're leaving with an image that you'll never forget. When you walk out of that front door, it's a fully encompassed image of what life is all about. And I think that's key. It's a lifestyle. It's an mm. image of opulence. It's an image of what South Africa has to offer. And it's an image of 
what the world wants to see in one mm. building. And that's really what we want to leave people with when, uh, when they come to visit us at the Leonardo. And you, what you say is so <coughs> right. It's the image of what South Africa has to offer. Because so often we, we look to America, we look to Europe, particularly when it comes to art and our hair. We need to start celebrating the wealth of talent that we have on this continent. And that's what the Leonardo does. I mean, with, as you said, all the artists are South African. Correct. And I think one other interesting fact, just, um, just quickly, is what also happens with a building like this and with the philosophy around a building, we also have an interest in the youth of South Africa. Because at the end of the day, the youth are our future. Mm -hmm. So young artists, we, we want to inspire young artists coming into, coming into the industry from, from the early ages that have got the talent. And I, and I believe in our journey, we're going to inspire young artists. Mm -hmm. We're going to inspire the youth because they are the future of South Africa across all spectrum in business. That's our future and legacy on intent on doing that. And as you said, the Leonardo is a beacon. It's a, a candle that stands out amongst everything else. So just in closing, I understand that your team does offer weekly art tours. Can you share a bit more details with us? And um, if the people are interested in attending, how they go about booking a tour? So in terms of booking a tour, you'll see along the bottom of the screen the details to book. The email address and contact number is there. But just a quick overview of them. They happen on Wednesdays and Fridays at this stage at 6 o'clock in the evening. They, it's 200 Rand for a tour, and you're going to tour some of the most amazing art. However, if you would like to put together a private group, um, so you've got eight friends, very interested in art, you want to come and have a really great dinner, come and do the art tour with Sinead, come and enjoy it with Sinead because she, uh, she's so passionate mm. about it. And then you end up in Orem, which is also another curated art experience of food. And, um, you know, you've got an evening. And, uh, and I think uh, once you see this art, uh, you are, you'll keep coming back because yes. one last thing, every time I come here, I notice something different. And if I can tell you, I've been here between 80 and 100 times already. And if I can notice something different every time, I guarantee you will too. Well, thank you, Robert. And thank you to the team. I mean, we've, you've made us feel like this is our second home. I mean, they've really welcomed us and made us feel. So to everyone, please do make an effort. It's one of the things you should be putting on your bucket list to do in Johannesburg. Come have lunch here. Explore the Leonardo. As mentioned in our first APSA Artworks episode last week, as part of our series, I've selected some of my choice artists for 2020. And as Robert has shared with us, we have such a rich talent of visual artists across the continent. And I unfortunately have not been able to include everyone in that I would have liked, as the list would have been far too long. But the works selected are works by these artists that I would definitely suggest that you need to include into your collection. I would like to encourage you by supporting these artists by investing in their artworks. And at the same time, all the proceeds from the sale of these artworks will go to the artist. The next artist from my selection that I would like to introduce you to is Helena Hugo. Welcome to my studio in Pretoria. I am Elena Hichu. I have been a full-time artist for the past 25 years since graduating from the University of Pretoria in 1996. What does it mean to be a practicing artist? It means making a lot of sacrifices, of being patient, of being committed to something that won't show immediate results. It also means having an inner urge to create that will never ever go away. I'm interested in many different mediums and subject matter, but I'm best known for my pastel portraits. My technique is labor intensive. I work an average of 12 hours each day sometimes longer depending on deadlines and I work most weekends. It still takes me almost two weeks to finish a, a small portrait. I don't think I would ever be able to work faster or take shortcuts. Uh, it will just feel wrong. Uh, this is who I am. Um, perhaps it's a, a little bit obsessive compulsive behavior. I don't know. Uh, but I like to tap into every last bit of information of my imagery 
my work is not really that realistic when you look at it closely. I try to take it beyond realism, almost like seeing more than what is really there or what is apparent. Um, my oils take a little bit faster because I use a sketching kind of technique and only one or two colours. I prefer using hardboard as my support. This is perhaps a bit unconventional, but it is the kind of support which I prefer, which works best for me. The hardboard is sanded down first to give the pastel the right kind of surface to cling to. Uh, ideally, it should feel velvety to the touch. Initially, a line drawing is made with charcoal, after which I start building up the drawing with pastel. My easel is placed at a slight angle leaning forward so that the pastel particles will not fall on the bottom part of the drawing while working. Uh, I also do not fixate my work, so I have to be very careful while working not to smudge the rest of the drawing. After a drawing is finished and after I have photographed it, it needs to be framed behind glass as fast as possible. Artists who cannot afford outsourcing, which I think or most of us, uh, need to be multi-talented in a way. I do all of my own packaging and I do most of my own deliveries if it's in my own province. And then, like any other business, there is always a lot of admin to do, uh, entailing many different aspects from uh, managing websites and social media to compiling price lists to writing artist statements and writing descriptions of artworks uh, and this often interferes with production. Good outside uh, opportunities can be really really helpful but it is a profession that also relies a lot on the artist herself or himself in terms of the kind of choices you make, uh, the ceaseless amount of time and energy you are willing to offer up and, and even the type of risks you are willing to take. Um, art can be very powerful. Uh, artists have the opportunity and the ability to say and do anything with their art to uh, to spread in any kind of message that they would like to. Uh, because of this, I think um, art is not merely just a form of enjoyment, of putting pencil to paper, but it always goes hand in hand with responsibility. Uh, a, a good guideline perhaps to follow is to always be just true, true to yourself. Just be honest with yourself and also be honest towards the viewer. Thank you, Elena. And for me as a curator, that's one of the special things is always to have the personal insight and behind the scenes of the artist. And that's what Helena was able to share with us. Our second guest this morning is Puso Fisher. Now, Puso is head of, fam uh, of the family office and business development in APSA's relationship banking division. The APSA family office provides full service banking and non-banking financial services to grow, preserve, and manage the investments and assets of, wealth of wealthy families. Through a combination of best-in-class, local and global expertise, the family office provides wealth transfer strategies to protect family legacies. Puso herself has over 15 years financial market experience, which spans across corporate and investment banking, as well as private wealth management. Within corporate investment banking, Puso has managed client portfolios of public sector, 
corporate and institutional clients where her responsibilities included dealing in money markets, trading credit derivatives, and structuring currency derivatives. In private wealth management, Puso ran a business with over 26.5 billion. I just have to repeat that. I mean, that's a figure I cannot even comprehend. 26.5 billion assets under management while leading a team of portfolio and wealth managers. In her current role, Puso has a countrywide responsibility for the APSA family office and offshore banking. A bit about um, Puso herself, she holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Witts University and a Master's degree in Business Administration from um, the Universe, University of Pretoria's Gordon Institute of Business Science. Puso, welcome for joining us and all I can say is Wow, you must, what a portfolio that you get to work with. Oh, thank you so much, Paul. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today with you. And I look forward to our discussion. And I mean, the Leonardo, what amazing place. Have you had a chance to look at the artworks here today? Paul, from the time the elevator doors opened up and I walked out, immediately you get the sense of upliftment when you look at all these beautiful art pieces. It really feels like walking through a very modern gallery with a perfect lighting, perfect ambience. And I was saying to myself, how lucky am I that I get, mm. up, I get to wake up on a Thursday morning going to work at the Leonardo, <laughs> chatting to you about art and surrounded by all this beautiful art. And how they've designed this place, maintaining the simplicity of the space but making the artworks the hero of the moment. Absolutely, and for me what's very important is that I think the entire hotel is, um, it's like a tribute to South African art um, and, and South African artists and the, the wealth of creativity that we have in our nation that we can definitely all be proud of. So true, so true. Would you like to just share with our viewers um, a bit of an overview of the um, APSOS family office and the services it provides? Certainly. So the APSA family office uh, is basically a group of very passionate, experienced professionals who look after the interests financially and non-financial assets of uh, wealthy families. So, you know, our, our clients, um, their lives are very complex. Um, you know, we have to deal with investments across different jurisdictions um, and, and also it, it's beyond uh, banking because wealth is about more than money. Mm. So, so we look after our clients at, at, by offering them not only banking services, but also non-banking uh, financial services and other non-banking services, basically to uh, help them grow their wealth or preserve their wealth or leave a legacy yeah. and pass that wealth on from generation to generation. And I know in our talking as well, you've got a passion for the visual arts. I certainly do. Um, you know, when I'm not uh, working with family office clients, um, you can find me behind my Canon camera lens. <laughs> I really absolutely love photography. Um, and I was actually quite uh, influenced by one of the masters, Rembrandt. And yeah. I try and, and uh, copy his, his style of lighting, the way wow. he lights portraits with that classic triangular uh, piece of light on one of the cheeks and having the subject close to the light source. Um, so it's, it's amazing that, you know, someone from the 1600s mm. is still very relevant uh, in today's times because also Rembrandt has influenced uh, cinematographers uh, and other photographers to this day. So you're working almost on your retirement there or second career as a photographer? Look, Paul, I'll be coming to you for, for art advice and how to get into the scene once I, I retire from banking. <laughs> And do you collect works yourself in terms of collecting or do you just admire artworks? So I absolutely, absolutely love uh, art. You know, my, my passion points in art um, are more the sculptures and photography. Um, you know, you know, budget permitting, I, I think uh, if I had an unlimited budget, uh, there's, there are so many art pieces, especially mm. by local artists, um, that I would love to have in my collection. Um, photography as well, uh, I'm inspired by photographers like mm. Franz Lemons from, um, from, from the Netherlands, and he actually sparked my interest in uh, photography and, and taking up photography as a hobby. I think one of the questions people often say is it's not also just about maybe the budget. People often say storage of artworks and things like that. And you know, 
like like you know yourself maybe i do have that shall we say a fairly extensive art collection in you know uh, um that i've managed to accumulate and invest in and of course the house is not always big enough but one of the things is you know and it's maybe to guide people is to say you know you don't always have to have everything on the wall you can actually store it in various you know art storage drawers and bring out new work now and then so you yeah. can keep refreshing your house and things like that so it, it gives it a completely new look and feel every every few months when it comes to uh, you know what comes to mind for you when you think of investing in an art piece so Paul, when you when you talk investing, um, you're moving into the space where you're actually now talking about more than just simply buying, because um, you know with an investment cap on, um, you're thinking of uh, getting a return on your investment. So uh, when it comes to investing in art, uh, art can be considered an asset. Um, and with, with any asset, uh, well, specifically with art, you know, art would be what you call uh, an alternative um, asset. And when you think of investing in assets, uh, even if it's art, a lot of the tried and tested um, philosophies around investments um, can still apply, Paul. Mm. So, for example, uh, in the art space, in the art world, you definitely still have to do your research. And I would yes. say lots of it because it is that alternative, unique space that you're dealing in. Um, so getting a feel for the market uh, in, in, arts, mm. in the art space uh, before you invest by speaking to curators, uh, visiting galleries, visiting art fairs, um, and, and trying to get a sense of uh, what adds value to a particular art piece. And of course at APSA, we have our art advisory services. So that's also a great place for someone to start um, when they're looking to embark on investing in art. As you say, get out there, explore the galleries, the art festivals, art fairs, etc. And maybe one of the questions our viewers might be asking is, can investing in art be the road to sort of untold fortunes? Well, I mean, we definitely hear of big numbers in the art world. Uh, when I think of just last year, the famous sculptor um, by uh, Jeff Koons, mm. I mean, he sculpted a rabbit uh, in 1986. And then last year, that sculpture sold for a whopping 91.1 million wow. US dollars. And it was actually recorded as the highest price that was ever paid uh, for artwork by a living artist. So now, Paul, I mean, if you think that is staggering, <laughs> then you come to one of the old masters like Leonardo da Vinci um, and his painting, Salvador uh, Mundi, sold for uh, last year uh, 450 million US dollars. I mean, that's that's almost half a billion, billion US dollars. Yes. I, I don't staggering. know. <laughs> it's a staggering amount. Absolutely staggering. So, you know, there definitely is money in the art world uh, and lots of it and lots to mm. be made. But when you come back to the principles of investing, um, you know, an experienced investor will always tell you that it's better to have a sound investment plan and a strategy that you follow and, and not to try and chase quick wins, mm. especially when it comes to something like art, where you really need to be prepared to invest for the long term and at the same time i think so important with art is as i say to people don't invest with the aim of trying to make money out of it you have to live with your artwork etc and for me it's, it's it becomes a marriage that has to hang on your wall buy art and invest in art that resonates with you that you can relate to if it does bring in that great investment return in years or decades in time that becomes an added bonus yes but it's 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 a joy that that artwork has it's the same as where we're sitting now surrounded by um Lorata's work it's really the joy we have seeing it on the wall and being able to discuss it absolutely paul i couldn't agree with you more i mean apart from your traditional investment assets. Um, art is that one asset, t asset class where um, it, it has a lot of intangible value. Mm. You know, art can evoke strong, positive emotions. Art has, has inspired love songs, has inspired film, mm. has inspired so many generations, has sparked debate. Um, it, it's told the message of, or, or portrayed messages of, of generations. Um, so, so definitely, uh, you know, art, you, you definitely need to enjoy it. Um, and, and as you said, 
the return that you get on your investment is definitely an added bonus, but you need to enjoy the journey because it might yes. be a long journey as well. Um, you know, because it does take some time to, to sell art depending on the artist um, and the artwork and how, how um, sought after the producer of that art is. So, I mean, how does one go about then valuing an artwork? Now, when you get to the art space, um, the same rules and principles that would be applied in, uh, in traditional um, financial assets don't really hold true because, you know, there aren't any quick mathematical formulae that you can use to, to calculate the intrinsic value of an art piece. Um, there, there tend to be 10 key mm. focus points uh, when valuing art. I would say, in my opinion, uh, the first and most important is who the artist is or was, mm. because some artists obviously are more influential than others. Um, and then what tends to happen in the art world, as you know, Paul, uh, is that deceased artists their works uh, sell for much more than living yes, artists. Yeah. And then it also goes to uh, how prolific the artist is. So when an artist produces high volumes of work, generally their work then tends to sell for less uh, versus those who don't uh, produce as uh, prolifically. Uh, but then again, you've got someone like Jeff Koons who's broken that mold. Yes. He's a prolific artist who then uh, sold uh, well one of his sculptures was sold for over 91 million dollars last year so it, it, it's, it's doing your homework as well and i Absolutely. think understanding you know the the trends in the market understanding who the artist is looking at you know this um the technique the subject matter Absolutely. how relevant it is what what they're getting across Absolutely. one one last question that i would like to pose before we get to our our next guest is what about capital gains tax, yes. particularly in South Africa when selling an artwork? Yeah. So, so um, Paul, this is obviously not going to be tax advice, but um, when you as a natural person own a piece of art uh, or artwork, um, even if it's uh, antiques, um, those personal use assets don't attract what we call capital gains tax. And capital gains tax is basically tax that's levied on uh, the, the profit that you make, which is the difference uh, between uh, what you bought your art piece for and what you sold it for. So with other financial assets, for example, shares, uh, as a natural person, capital gains tax would be 18%. Um, but then obviously that, that falls away uh, for a natural person who, um, it, who has art pieces. There's no capital gains tax. Um, so, so you get that added benefit that, you know, you, you get to enjoy your art piece mm. and then also you don't, get, you don't get tax. But then there is one provision that um, you, you, that you keep the art for non-business purposes. Oops. That is one no. of the conditions. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, and then for people wanting to know more about the um, APSA family office, where do they go or who do they contact? Well, the family office um, is by invitation only. Um, but what happens is within, the, uh, within APSA Wealth, we have business development managers um, who would help uh, onboard clients to join our wealth division. And from there, uh, they can be invited to the family office. Thank you, um, Puso. But we've got um, just a question from one of our viewers, um, and I think very relevant. Thank you for this. Um, where do you find relevant art trends? And it's, for me, it's, 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 as you said, educating yourself, visiting exhibitions, going to galleries, going to art fairs, festivals. Yes and doing your homework. Absolutely doing your homework. And I think what's very interesting about the era that we live in now is that also the online space has given uh, opportunities for, for many artists. So um, if we look at uh, last year, 2019, in the global art space, um, about 64 billion US dollars worth of art was sold. Um, and then about 6 billion of that was done online. Wow. And, and what's very interesting also is the influence of millennials in that online mm. space. Because of that six billion US dollars, um, we had 92% of that coming from millennials who were buying. And about half of that was from new buyers, so people buying for the first time online. 
Thank you so much, Pusa. Thank you. And really insightful. Our next guest to join us this morning comes from the Western Cape, and one that I am both honored and humbled to have join us this morning. I mean, I would like to, she needs no introduction, but I would, she is a living legend. She's South Africa's leading rock artist, Corin Zoyed. So Corin, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. How are you? I'm good, Paul. Thank you so much for your kind words. Lovely to see you. Good to see you, and I know you're in the middle of moving house and everything, so it must be a bit chaotic, so um, thank you very, very yeah. much for um, availing yourself, you know, and um, sharing a bit of your special passion that you have for the visual arts with us. Yeah, I mean, it is a huge passion. Thank you. The move, I've, I'm hiding in a, in a corner. The truck's going to come any minute. But um, I love talking about art. I wish, I think secretly, I wish I was a, um, a visual artist, <laughs> uh, but I'm not, unfortunately. But I love hanging out with artists. And um, yeah, I even have my own little art auction that I do on Facebook now during um, this year, I started doing it and um, for, for my friends and just uh, kind of to hang out. And I've met so many fantastic new artists and been exposed to so much more this yeah we have a, f a fantastic scene and incredibly talented people um doing cool things so yeah that's where i want to be so thank you for inviting me can you maybe just share with us a bit of the art auction you know that you're running on facebook um with us and for our viewers if they're interested where they would go to find more out about this yeah, so I just kind of started it as a fun thing in the beginning of lockdown. It's called Art in the, it's called, uh, Art in the Time of Corona. And I literally just off my Facebook page started um, uh, posting pictures of artwork. Also, kind of many of the artists are very famous. So people are, have been buying art for a steal. But, you know, we're just, you know, uh, what Puza just said about, you know, scarcity marketing is so important, also in music, you know, that you can't be everywhere and think that you're going to mm -hmm. get paid. But there is such a thing as just, you know, um, it's just the process. It's who you are. So, you know, my friends have been painting and taking pictures and um, I myself also, and it's just the need is there to reach out and, you um, um, it's just making people very happy. So I'm going to do another one. Anybody watching? Um, I announce them out of the blue and then they just go away because it's very famous people. And <laughs> it takes a lot of convincing, but they, I've had, I've had people like Lionel Smith on it. I've had Jock Kutzer on it. I've had uh, uh, Lucy Pete, who's a fantastic new artist uh, from Limpopo province on it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go through all the names, okay. but yeah, we'll do another one soon. Well, you mentioned that I'm going to let's start there because you, we've got some insight into some of your collection you, you, you've willingly shared with us. And I see one of the works there that, um, we've, that should come up on the screen is a Lionel Schmidt, if I, you know. Yeah, so that is a, I don't know if you can see it, um, it's, a, it's a sculpture. That's very, very dear to me. It's on my set of my chat show. It's next to my side table. It's called State. And my show is called Republic von Zoid Africa because it's my own little world that I'm in. And I interview all the wonderful people of our land. And um, that sculpture, just, it's how I feel. It's a, a state of mind, a state of being. Um, and you can just, I don't know, when it, it's, it's a very heavy bronze. Um, little sculpture and it's just yeah it just it's almost like it's almost like a, a a good luck charm and a chalice of just being in the zone and in conversation with people i'm a huge socrates fan so i believe in dialogue and really immersing myself um in conversation so yeah it just puts me in the right state for doing interviews. i must share something with you corin <laughs> i mean i i was at um the Car Con Car Arts Festival. It must have been about 12 years back and Lionel Schmidt did an exhibition of his works then. And you know, it's, it's one of these times when one almost kicks oneself because I saw, I walked into the space and I fell in love with his works immediately. And it was one of those, the, this, mm -hmm. this, 
um, decisions. Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I buy it? Shouldn't oh, I? Sure. And I, d I hesitated. And 10 years later, and I can't afford to buy it. You know, I mean, and, mm, mm. and I think it's, you know, it's yeah, one of those. Matters. I, I should have, you know, listened to my gut at that moment because like you, I love his works. There's something about it that evokes an emotive response when you look at it. You know, there's something about him, actually. It's mm. the fact that, you know, Lionel, during lockdown, I started doing art exhibitions and Lionel started doing concerts at his studio, at his art studio, streaming concerts. He, he's had Honor Carstens, Jan Blum. Uh, I mean, it's crazy. He's got a whole world. He's into videography. He just had a fantastic music, music video for a band called Southern Wild. Um, he's just such a creative person and I think there's something that's why I think we're drawn to him because those eyes whenever yes. you see his paintings you know you know he did a lot of closed eyes and at one point they all opened but those eyes that he paints it's like him he's a deep soul so oh oh seal the old man inside <laughs> <laughs> wise wise old man and it comes through in his work and people are drawn to him physically emotionally and artistically because of it um He's a real uh, cheerleader of, mm. of, of people. Another work you've got here, and I, I mean, as um, Pusa and myself were talking, we're never too old to learn. Um, this particular, particular work that we've got, I mean, it's almost um, of yourself, a portrait, but who was this? Can you give us a bit more information oh, on so this? I've yeah, I wanted to just give this guy some air time. Like, you know, the way, Paul, that you just said you missed out on Lionel Smith. This kid's name is Emil Wierpener. A uh, young artist, young boy. He gave this to me as a gift. And I mean, sometimes people give you, you know, when you're a musician, presents and portraits of yourself. It's kind of awkward because, you know, that person put so much time into it. But mm -hmm. where would you put this in your house? You can't, you know, have paintings of yourself in your own house. It's just weird, you know. And I just thought this is just incredible. It's the lyrics written all over this, of a song I wrote for my son called As Musik Begin Spiel. So it's written all over my face. Wow. And this, the lyrics of that particular song is my wish, you know, in a, in, in a song you only have three and a half minutes to say what you want to say. So in the song I just tell him, you know, you've got to, sometimes life will be hard, but celebrate the good times. You've got to sing when the music starts playing because you need your strength for later. So it's just what I believe written all over my face um and yeah he just does beautiful things he paints with gouache paint which is something you don't see often no. um and he's got that yeah he's very modern and futuristic in the sense that he's des he's a designer and a painter and an illustrator in one where i mean that was kind of back in the day not how it worked you know in fine no. arts uh but the new generation of artists are, you got to do it all. And Lionel, for me, once again, one of the people leading the way in that sense, that he's, mm. he's painting, he's sculpting, he's making video, he's animating, um, really extending himself um, to be as much of an artist as possible. So Emil, I'd say if he sees things, buy it. I'm buying Emil. I definitely think someone we need to be watching, Pusa. Um, definitely, while uh, you know he's he's new and, and newly to be discovered, um, it's a it's a great time to get in because a uh, mm. few years down the line, and then we'll find ourselves in a situation once again where we can't afford his artwork. I'll be kicking myself <laughs> like with the Lionel Schmidt. So. And Puzo, if I can add to what Puzo was saying earlier, to you know people who are buying art or wanting to get in in in, in the game, you know, of collecting. What I love about art is that you're investing, it's almost like you're buying a stock, you know, mm. like, you know, and the Americans love buying stocks, you buy a stock in this. It's the same way that you invest in a company, that you believe that that company, you know, Coca-Cola will still be around in 10 years time, you know, yes. as long as they sell water because nobody wants to drink too much sugar now, but whatever, <laughs> you know, they own Bonac, well, we're gonna, we're gonna keep buying Coke shares. And that's the same thing. And an artist is a brand, and in our world, it's just a reputation. It's just the word we use. It also means brand. So the reputation is you know that 
I know Emil because I met him personally. I can see his work ethic and I can see, you know, what he's doing with his career. So I believe I'm betting on him. I'm betting on him being a success because he's thinking about what he's doing, you know, the same way that, you know, that's the struggle for most artists is um, some of them are so brilliant, but it's this fine world between, uh, is he a genius or is he an idiot? And I find myself in that realm. Some days I'm like, wow, did I make that? And then okay. tomorrow I do something extremely stupid, but um, you've got to find a artists that have a head on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. You can invest in them, or at least are surrounded by people like Paul Bayless, like, you know, the curators and managers of this mm -hmm. world. It's, it's exactly the same as sports or, course buying stocks in a company I think. Your next work that's on the screen you would like to just share a bit of that with us. Um... I love this one this is a very special um, piece because it was one of those uh, we got it years ago for next to nothing this is Richard Scott this artist he even makes his own paint and I mean, today is unaffordable. It's blown up all over the world, but this is a massive piece that's hanging over my bed. Um, and actually what I wanted to tell you is the funny story. I think there's a second Richard Scott, the smaller one, if they want to just slide up the, the second. But this there, painting, Paul. There we are. Oh, go are. back, go back, go back. That <laughs> one, okay. So I played, I played at his kid's schooled fundraiser. I traded him a gig for this painting. Oh, wow. So this is my pride and joy. <laughs> when the house burns down, I'll just grab it because I felt so chuffed with myself. <laughs> but but I, I got it. So we traded, uh, yeah, I traded a gig for this one. Corin, I think that's such an important thing as well, because it's a story behind the artwork that you then as well, besides the artwork, it's how you, in this case, came and got that artwork into your collection, which is sometimes as valuable and as important to the work itself. That's the thing I don't get. How can anybody buy art they don't like, even if it's worth a fortune? You know, I think to me that's, I wouldn't listen to music I don't like. Why would I buy, I, that's, that's rule number one. That's rule number one. Mm. The buying of the art is also an expression of who you are. For me, it's almost like, you know, some people use social media just to sell, sell, sell. Yes. Um, they are very boring. And um, the interesting people on social media are mm. the people that are expressing themselves through that medium because mm. it's a creative medium. Yes, you can be creatively sell things, but you can share thoughts, you can share images, ideas, um, yeah, parts of your life. Uh, and um, yeah, for me, that's the, the story, definitely. But before the story is, do you love it? Do you, can, you have to love it. Can, can you relate to it? And does it speak to you? I think that's so important. One of the questions that we've just been asked by, by our viewers and um, is it more rewarding investing in an emerging artist or an established artist? Definitely emerging because mm. it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot cheaper and the rewards are going to be a lot greater. But I also um, think... I also think it's seen, <laughs> it's seen the artist watching their careers grow in that. Absolutely. I mean, Pusa? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, the interesting thing, Karen, is that when we look at um, how the art world globally performed last year, um, the old masters who are, you know, the, the Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, you, who, those who live between 1250 and, and 1821, their art pieces tend to sell for these astronomical prices. But uh, in terms of the percentage by mm. volume and also sales, um, last year they only made up about uh, seven to eight percent of, of global auction sales, whereas your post-war contemporary artists, those born after 1910, those made up between 51 and 53 wow. percent of global sales. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. definitely, mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a definite interest in those emerging artists because I think that's also where you get the opportunity mm. to to buy low and sell high. Um, but of course, Karen, I think there are some pieces in your, well, I think the pieces that you've shown us so far, I don't think you'd ever want to sell. 
No, no I don't, that's yeah. the thing, and that's that's the thing. You don't. You sh I, I know it's an investment, but it's it's something to keep. Look, mm. if there's a crisis, and my son, I don't for some reason have no money. I can send him to university with that one painting, which is <laughs> good to know. But um, yeah, I buy them. They make me happy, and it's just. It's better than looking at numbers on the screen, isn't it? You know, for me to to that's what I know. That's what my life is, and um, yeah, you know, maybe maybe if I was a banker, I would be on the stock exchange. But uh, I'd know nothing of that mm. world. So this is what I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we spoke about following on from that question around emerging artists, and you know, one of the things we've mentioned is. Um, we are doing a call to action in terms of some of the artists that I've picked for 2020. And just to share some of those um, images with you and some of those artists, you know, so um, one of the works that is by um, Marco Selacani, and, you know, he deals very much with um, imagery around migrant work, um, and um, dealing with with in communities and people having to almost be displaced because of where they work and things like that. And I mean, again, a lot of t terms. If we look at some of his work, deals with the miners and that that you know it almost becomes the bedrock mm -hmm. of the South African economy. But um, when you look at his work, there's there's a sort of simplicity to it. But there's detail within each of the imagery. Absolutely, Paul. Yeah. And, and I think what's so uh, phenomenal about his work is that he takes uh, people who would ordinarily be overlooked in mm. society and, and puts them on a stage for people to experience their experiences through his art. It's very much where we found ourselves in 2020 with the pandemic where the people that often were overlooked were the ones that were at the core front of society's response Absolutely. to the pandemic. So um, a lot of similarity there. Yeah. Um, Corin, I think one of your favorite works, and I stand corrected here, not to put you on the spot, is um, from the collection is a work by Jakob van Skolkvik. Yes, I love this one. What I quickly want to say about that previous one, did you notice how it's almost the, it's two of each? It's, it's almost a carbon copy, the one man standing, and I think there's something, he's trying to say something there, you know, of, it just feels like a ghost version, like mm. there's one man and then the other man, it's the same man, but it's, and even the, the actual mind, there's a ghost of the mind, ghost of the past, it's the same story over and over. That's a vibe I'm getting from this. Anyway, um, the picture I love, the one that you're showing me, you know what, light. Those trees, if you can bring them up again. This yeah. is just, I don't know if those trees are indigenous. Something ominous is going on here. But light to me is the what arrangement is to music. You know, we can all sing the same song, a choir, the Tiger Book Choir can do a version of Imagine It'll Be Very Nice. Then the Ndlovu Choir will do a version, it'll be different. And then you give Lady Gaga a piano and she does Imagine and she arranges and, and reworks it and it's something else. And light changes the story. So it just gives the story a signature um, uniqueness that I just, yeah, something about that. And it's just so difficult to do. So whenever mm. I see anything that was sketched or painted with the light, actually, um, it's almost like they painted the light, yeah. you know? It's just, how do you do that? It's just, and I'm there, I'm there, in, I'm there in, in, at, at night in, that, in those mm. woods when I, I look at it. I mean, for me as well, you know, one forgets when you look at this work is the lack of color a very sort of monochromatic work you know um mm. as you said the light and darkness within it and if we look at yako he paints very much on a large scale we might not really get the appreciation of this particular work on screen but he paints some of his works are very large scale technically 
very strong. And I think when you look at this work, you pulled into it and you start looking beyond the work itself as almost Absolutely. wanting to explore what you're not seeing within with, within that forest. Absolutely. And this is certainly a piece where you could, you could look at it a thousand times and, and still mm. find something uh, bewildering mm. about it. And, you know, there's a very, we've got another work of um, yakus that will also now just, you know, very similar. And again, as I think, Karen, as you said, that light and darkness. And there's almost, even though it's still, the, 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 there's a sense of movement within that work as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just so melancholic. I mean, it's mm. just, I just, I'm just a sucker for this stuff. Like I would hang this in my house. I love, I love black. That's why I have so many colorful works because my walls at my studio are black. I wear black and everything. I like dark mm. um, stuff. So sometimes I just need some brightness to break <laughs> my own mild <laughs> depression. But that melancholia, oh, there's just something okay. there. And I just love the way how when something scalable, like, like a big painting like that, it's just a frame, it's just a piece of a forest. It feels like an entire universe. Mm -hmm. You know, that the uh, photography also does that. Puzo, you were talking about your love of photography. It's just a way that something, a corner of a table or a certain yeah. angle of a mountain, and it's just a universe within a frame. So Karen, I mean, what I found very enlightening in our talk is how you draw uh, inspiration from art as an artist, uh, you know, in, in, in the music space and, and how you draw the similarities between uh, visual arts and musical arts. Uh, and I think it's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to see the marriage between the two, um, you've, you've given me a new perspective as well on some of the artworks that we've looked at. So thank you for that. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm just, uh, but it's very cool. I just want to say, guys, thank you that you're doing this, hey, because there are so many, I don't think people always realize how big South African art is in the world. If you look at somebody like Zanele Mahuli, Mahuli, mm -hmm. am I saying her name correctly? Mahuli. She is blowing up in Paris. I mean, you can't yes. afford her work. But no. if you walk down the street, people will, won't recognize her. Mm. Uh, Robin Road, I don't know if it's Road or Rode, also here from the Western yeah. Cape. He's got the biggest freaking studio in the world in flippin' Berlin. Um, and the Germans love him, but nobody here knows who he is. And sometimes it's a typical South African thing of we think, yeah, South African mm. art, it's kind of sweet, but we are in demand in the world, mm. you know? We come from a difficult country. That is the arts, those dark places like those woods, you know, it's a bit, it's not so simple here. Yeah. So people are intrigued. We haven't got it all figured out, but you know, we have the opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, because we have a bit of, um, I heard this, sorry, I'm gonna top, stop talking now, but I have to say, I heard on a podcast the other day, the symbol for chaos is one part Opportunity, one part chaos. I oh, forget the after. Oh, I'm going to send you the story. I'm talking nonsense. <laughs> but um, but when the point, I can't remember what the symbol is for now. But I'm having a brain wobble. But um, wh wherever we have difficulty, we always have opportunity. Mm. Wherever there's darkness, there's always light. So South Africa is a great place to gamble on. Yeah. It's an and emerging market. It's great art. So. I'm, I'm going to just show on the screen um, our final work just to end off there uh, in terms of our discussion because one of the questions our guests have, our, our viewers have asked is are these works um, available? The works that we showed from Karen Studio unfortunately are not available um, but the works from the catalogue and that are and those, that catalogue um, will be um, available shortly and, and online you um, on screen you will see where the catalog can be a, um, assessed this particular work i'm just going to end off our discussions with um karen because it's a work by lechonolo mashaba and the reason i'm also putting this up is also a joburg based artist he works with text 
um, that he overlays. We showed one of your earlier works that, um, where we had text. He has a different working in terms of how Lechonolo brings text in terms of from SMSs and that, and he overlays it and creates mm -hmm. sort of the density within the work and the figures are very much more representative of who he is as an individual. So he always works with the human figure, but interplays it with text. And why I've particularly shown this work um, is next week we will be um, broadcasting or live streaming from Lechonolo's um, studio. And one of the things, as Karen also indicated, was you don't know if we, we get to know the artist or the artwork, but we don't get to know the artist. And the artist could actually walk past you on the street, and you actually don't know that mm. you that, you walking, know. That, that you're actually meeting a Lechonolo or a uh, um, Scott or um, Michael Selacani. But yeah, you've got, you recognize their works, and that's what becomes so important. And as we shared in last week's webinar, attend gallery openings, go to the art festivals, because when you do that, you get to emerge yourself into the visual arts, and you get to meet the artist mm. and spend time with them. So, Corin, really, mm -hmm. um, we have to wrap it up here. I know we could continue on for hours, but I just want to really thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your passion. Thank you for your continued support of the visual arts in South Africa. And, you know, before we go, any final comments from your side? Um, I just, I don't know. I want to say thanks. Thank you. And, um, yeah, all the best with this webinar. I hope um, that you guys do more. Paul, I think you guys can do a whole show. Why don't you open it up a bit more? You know? <laughs> open it up, open it up, put this stuff out there, you know? Because yeah. it's almost, I think people will buy art if they realize, you know, like that Richard Scott cost mm. 13,000 Rand. Now you're going to pay 300,000 Rand for it. Wow. You know, teach people, teach mm. people. You guys are bankers. You're the financial people. We can paint and sing and hunt together. But you guys can explain. I mean, that man's painting, I'm not familiar with the artist. I'm so sorry. Please don't think I'm stupid. But you can see he's trying to enculturate himself. Can, mm. If I could say my last request, can we look at that painting one more time? Yeah. Of the man with all these things. He is enculturating mm. himself. Mm. That's what an artist does. And um, we need our patrons. So anybody who's ever gone to exhibition, thank you. If you watch a show, if you listen to music, if you... If you go to a play, you are you are supporting people that are feeling like this man. We want to be part of everything, and we want to enculturate and share and give and learn. And um, this is our language. So, thank you, Absa. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Puzo. And I think make a show. Thank and you. Thank interview you, all these wonderful <laughs> artists. Interview them. Thank you, Karen. That's a challenge <laughs> for us. Um, yes. But. Thank you very much, and it's really, it has all uh, fantastic for your insights, and just really um, taking us a bit into your home there, Karen. Our second artist video that um, I'd like to share with you is the father and son video of Ye Johannes and Colin Masungane, sculptures from Northern Limpopo. Hi, uh, this is Colin Maswangani. I am at home today, uh, carving with the legend, my father, a famous artist, Johannes Maswangani. Uh, we are carving uh, using a special tool called Matlo, of which Absa made a film about it, uh, called the Mbato story. So myself and my father are collab collaborating on uh, a work called uh, My Bishop Dead, of which my father is teaching me about the Bible and is also teaching me about life. So this 
is always an opportunity for me to come with him as he stays in Limpopo and I'm always based in Jobe. So every time I get an opportunity to visit uh, home and come with him, it is always a privilege for me. I really love the works by Colin and his father. And I mean, what talented sculptures we have. I know within APSA we've got a particular work that Colin produced um, a few years back um, entitled climbing, climbing My Way to the Top mm -hmm. and almost climbing up that ladder to receive, um, to get one's identity, stature and approval within society. But that work is made from, he, he, they, they use um, dead wood. They don't use living trees and that as they produce the work. And this particular work that Colin produced is from a single piece of wood that, and within it, he produced, he cut away a chain within that work with no kinks or um, within the chain. It's a solid chain. It, it moves. And when a sculpture can do that, mm. you know they reached their peak. And I know of only two really um, wooden sculptures within South Africa that I've seen their work, that have, they've been able to produce a complete chain with no breaks in it from a single piece of wood. So um, fantastic work by, by Colin and we do have one of his works by him and his father within the um, catalogue as well. So in closing, Key takeouts that we can really share with you is one, um, Pusla, as you said, do your homework. Yes. You know, um, don't just go out and rush and buy an artwork. Yes. Do your homework. Look at what's the, the you know, get an idea of the trends and that. Look at what's happening locally and internationally. But also buy what resonates with you. Yes. Don't buy just for the, the sake of making money. Absolutely. Buy what resonates with you because it's like a marriage. You have to live with this artwork. It's going to be on the wall. It's going to bring you great joy over the years. So um, do your homework and then go with, go with what, what resonates with you and support our young emerging artists in across across this continent. We've got such a rich, rich wealth. And, ro and lastly, do come visit the Leonardo. So special thanks to my guests today who made themselves available to Robert Hodson, General Manager of Marketing for the Legacy Hotels and Resorts at the Leonardo. Come through here, come have a lunch, come on the art tours, really, please. Um, and really just emerge yourself in a wealth of artistic talent when you come here. To Karen um, Zoid um, for availing her time and um, from her house in, in, in the Western Cape, thank you. And lastly, to our in-studio guest, um, Puso, from um, head of um, APSA family office. Any final thoughts from your side? Well, thank you so much, Paul. It's been such a wonderful morning uh, with you and our viewers. Um, and I think that I, I 100% agree with your, your key takeaway points, um, you know, and I think another message to drive home is that when it comes to investing in art, um, it's, it's a long-term journey. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so unlike shares that can be sold intraday, um, it, it, you, need to, you need to think for the long term, plan for the long term. And like Karen was saying, you know, look for something that, that you love, that, that resonates with mm. you. Um, and then the financial rewards and uh, additional tax benefits will come later, but enjoy the journey. Enjoy it. And that's it. It is a journey. To everyone that joined us, thank you. I look forward to you, um, you joining us next week. Um, same time, 3rd of December at 11 o'clock. And um, we're going to, the, the episode will again be packed with exciting guests. And as I indicated, we are going to be live from the studio of artist Lechonolo Mashaba. Um, his studio is in Duenfontein, Johannesburg. We're going to have um, be a bit of behind the scenes, some insight into his personal working space. And at the same time, we're going to be joined by Lana Africa Bread and Camp. So till then, goodbye. <laughs>